Welcome to the Dan John Podcast, Episode 7. Who would believe we'd get this far? So the question of goal setting comes up constantly. And it's and it's an interesting thing. I think goal setting is is more recent than most people think. I, I'm not sure, uh, you know, some farmer back in 1620 was like, you know, here's my vision of things. I, I don't know if that's true. Could have been, certainly. Uh, um, but goal setting, for, as I understand, is a very recent thing in the last hundred years. Uh, uh, Dale Carnegie courses and things like that, Earl Nightingale. Um, but in the fitness industry, I think it's we've always had goal setting in kind of an interesting way because it's always almost universally to, uh, you know, lean down, tone down, whatever the phrase of the month is. Uh, there's this idea you want to look, look a certain way and almost universally it's not not possible. I was with my friend uh, Coach Steve-O this weekend and he's the person who really helped me work with the clarity of goal setting. Um, as a track athlete, goal setting is A to B. You throw 180, that's who you are. You're literally a 180 foot thrower. That's that's who you are. You're a 49 second 400 meter runner. And your goal is this other number. So as when you throw, throw 180, um, people then start hitting on you to throw 190 or 200. Well, you start doing a few things, and if it gets closer to 190 or 200, you're right. And if you get to 200, well, you got your goal, and now you're a 200-foot thrower. And then, of course, the goal is to go farther. <clears throat> but see, that's not the way it works with 99.99999% of the population. Most people have what Steve-O calls A, not A goals. And I think it's actually kind of genius. And I, I'm a good example. See, you guys see this guy here. That's not who I think I am. I think I'm 21 years old, Utah State discus thrower, really hot girlfriend, uh, can drink beer every night and get up after four hours and get a 4.0 and do it again and again and again. So when I talk to my trainer, Ben or, or Robert or anybody at the gym, uh, Madison, Mitch, doesn't matter. My thought is always, you know, I want to be 21 again. See this guy here? That's not me. So that's A, not A goals. Look at me. Okay, that's who I am, but that's not who I think I am. So one of the things you have to do when you're working with normal clients is get them to kind of embrace who they are, which is nearly impossible. So there's a couple funny tricks you can use. I've got this one, two, three, four assessment from the book, Can You Go?, which I think works really well. And it ends up, you char characterize somebody as a body composition client. That's if their waistline is over half the height. A mobility client, that's if they need more than one pillow to sleep comfortably at night. And the third, they're a strength client. Uh, that means they can't hold a two-minute plank. And of course, you can be combinations of any of those. So I have a little Venn diagram, and there's seven different people. So hi, I'm Dan. I'm a three. Okay, I'm a body comp client. That's great, and that works well. But there's another kind of interesting thing you can do is if you're a personal trainer, walk with your client as you say, oh, so nice to meet you, uh, and then you walk them to their car and open the car door and look inside. Look in the back seat of the car. If it's covered in fast food, uh, boxes and wrappers, you got a, you got a pretty serious mountain to climb. Uh, if the whole thing is decluttered and disarrayed, you can imagine what their kitchen is like. You can imagine what their refrigerator is like. You can imagine what their their basic nutrition life is like. It's cluttered. It's messy. It's going to sound weird, but maybe one of the best workouts you can do with a new client is, you know, every day they come in, you do a an original strength warm up. You do the 30, 30 for 30 workout. And then you both walk out to the car and this week we clean out the back seat. Next week we clean out the glove compartment. The next week we clean out the, the little, the little trays in there here and here and the, the coin tray. And the fourth week we vacuum the inside and clean the inside of the windows. I'm not saying anyone would ever do that, but there's a book I, I, I like a lot. It's called the declutter diet. And the author argues that people with body composition issues often have, well, of course, it's going to be their, their issue is that they don't 
well, the, in their past, they've eaten wrong, and this is just carried up till now, or too much processed food, too much, star, whatever we want to call starch, you know, whatever, cheap, cheap, easy to get carbohydrates, too much sugar, too many soft drinks, you know, the, you, you know the drill. And what we need to do is get them on this path, but it's real hard to get someone on this path to fitness, longevity, um, health, and maybe even performance, where every second of their life they're getting hit, bombarded by all these other ideas and all the junk that's around them. Uh, I like to have a clean house because I find if I've got all the laundry put away, all the dishes are where the dishes are supposed to be, it's very easy for me to write. I write better decluttered. That's why I write first thing in the morning, uh, about usually about 5.30 in the morning is when I write because my house is clean. There's only one dirty dish in the house, and that's my coffee mug, and it's easy for me to stay focused and on track. So when we talk about goal setting, very often I have to stop the – well, I don't – I would never say this to a client, but if I'm working with a trainer, I'll take – I'll remind the trainer that this person's goal list is just words they're throwing out at you. They don't really own it yet. Find out what they need body comp, mobility, or strength, or a combination of those three. Then try to help them declutter, clean up their life so they can take care of the important thing, especially in body composition, which is proper eating. Uh, you, as Tom Furman always says, you can't outrun a donut. Here in Salt Lake City, we had a bagel place. They wouldn't tell you how many calories were in the chocolate chip bagel. Finally, I had a student who worked there and I asked her and she said, 1100 calories so i want you to go on the airdyne or even any machine that reads off calories and i want you to work until you burn off 1100 calories uh, call me when you finish that's gonna be a tough one but if your life is decluttered you didn't eat a proper breakfast you do <clears throat> you didn't make a good lunch choice and you smell that chocolate chip bagel plop plop instant gratification and instant bigger belly so when we talk about goal setting, folks, it's more nuanced than most people think. Um, we have got to get personal trainers out of the sports mindset. Um, you jump six feet, now you want to jump seven feet. You, most clients aren't number-driven goals. That is why, by the way, I do like using the waistline in centimeters. If you show up at 109 and we get you down to 99, that's good numbers. That's going to... That's going to keep the person coming back. So that's just an introduction to goal setting. I just wanted to share that with you. Okay, we've had a couple of questions about hip replacements. And Neil asked specifically, I too have had both hips replaced. Any advice in training around these surgeries? Well, here's the funny thing. If the surgeries were done well, there should be no training around them. I just can only tell you my experience, but uh, doing Tim Anderson's Six Point Rocks, is a game changer. That's when I'm on my hands, knees, and feet. And I just gently, um, I do horizontal squats, these little rocks back and forth. It's great for your mobility. It's great for even some flexibility, I imagine. If you let your knees slowly widen out, um, it's called the frog pose, I believe, in yoga. And just sit there rocking. I did that every day the first time around, and I'm doing it every day this time around, and I find that to be a game changer. The second thing, I think almost universally is a good idea. Um, if you don't have a prowler, you can also just, I was going to say push a car, but make sure it's a small car. Uh, but prowlers are very good. The prowler, when you push, it you can go with a nice, you can go with any tempo you want. In the beginning, when I first, rec first was recovering, I had a nice, slow, steady cadence, and it works. Uh, of course, you know, your butt is connected to your big toe, so you're driving off that big toe, which is telling the, the glute to contract, to snap. Um, you can get a lot of work in. It's very safe. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, you're holding on to the handles. You're pushing in. If something, you know, you had any pain at all, you stop and you're done. There's nothing to it. So first off, the six-point rock. Number two, the prowler. Number three is going to depend on what you got going on. But for me, I find that a correctly done hip flexor stretch is gold.
is just absolute gold because it tends to stretch what what did get tight during the the limping process. And then number four, and this one's going to seem weird, but you need two sticks, um, a meter, three three feet long, hold them in the middle, and then march in place like this. Now I know it seems crazy until you do it, but if you have any kind of limp that's carried over, if you have any kind of uh, asymmetry that's carried over from the surgeries or the years of limping before, as you march in place, if you have an asymmetry, you'll hit yourself in the face with a stick. And it's weird because every time someone says, it looks like you're limping, I just stop and I'll just march away 20 steps and I'll, I'll kind of reconnect what not limping is. So I, I was limping for almost 11 years. No, actually 11 years. So my default gait right now is a limp. And so I have to remind myself I don't have to limp. And the, and the way I taught myself this was marching in place with two sticks. Uh, originally, I did this with a little, uh, a little weight. I was, I was dragging a weight, uh, about 10 pounds, uh, 5 kilos, around my, uh, with a head strap. But I quickly discovered I didn't need the head strap, that the sticks alone were all I needed. So those are just some simple things. I don't think any of it's crazy. And uh, I do hope uh, the great the great last lines of the Count of Monte Cristo, uh, wait and hope. I do hope that uh, you train because uh, the surgery is a what they call a God surgery. You know, it, made, it makes the lame walk. And it's now your job to make sure that surgery sticks. So good luck with you, okay? Neil and the other people who asked about hip replacements. Okay, my friend James emailed in, and uh, I should actually charge him by the word here, but here we go. I have a bundle of questions. Is that true? Boy, it is a huge number, so hang in there, about how runners, and particularly trail runners, might think about strength training. First, yes, they, so they should. Much of the way I look at strength training comes from a distance coach named Percy Cerruti. He was an Australian guy and everyone thought he was a nutcase because he believed in running up hills and deadlifts and bench press and swings and literally everything we teach today. Uh, he was so far ahead of his time. The one thing I didn't appreciate about him enough, uh, but like many throwers, he came to the same conclusion. He didn't believe in the heavy back squat. He didn't believe in heavy squatting to develop the legs. He believed in hill sprints, and it's the same discovery I had. So first, before I even get started, yeah, you should be lifting weights, but let's get to the particulars. Contrary to the notion that running is always healthy for anyone of any age at any level of conditioning, with my fitness goal, should strength be considered among the prerequisites of running? Yes. Yes, it should be. Uh, the reason is... Um, if you're stronger, every bounce, uh, every stride, boing, 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 is going to be a little bit farther. Uh, you'll be a little bit more resilient. You're probably going to be faster. Um, you'll be better at hills. You'll be better down hills. Um, do you often see people running for the wrong reasons? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, I, you know, the, what do they say about every if jogging is at my body weight is 2,500 pounds of hit every time my legs land because of uh, uh, Isaac Newton and all that stuff. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Um, uh, I think if you're running to lose body fat, I, it certainly could be part of it, but it's real clear that what you do in the kitchen is far more important than what you do on the trail. So, yeah, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're doing it as a sport, I'm behind you 100%. I get that, you know. But if you're doing it to lose weight or to do, ah, oh, there are better options, especially than jogging. I don't mind walking. I have nothing against sprinting ever. I don't have anything against what we would call running. It's that blah, blah, bang, bang, bang stuff I would be against. Assuming that a runner's priority is long-term strength and health with only occasional and deliberate risks uh, taken in the name of performance. I like how you said that. How might running work alongside and with a strength program? Well, boy, that's a, that's the classic two rabbits question, James. Um, 
I know that there's a guy online who does marathons and a massive deadlift, but there's a lot of people that doesn't think that he just uses vitamin D and uh, sunshine to get his get where he wants to be. That's a tough one. Now, when I was at Utah State, one of my teammates was Mark Enyart. He was an Olympian in the 800 meters, and uh, his strength training was real stuff. He he benched 225, probably to body weight 160 or 70 maybe. He was real strong, trained real hard, and went real fast. The the thing I would say with you. I would look more to the work of Barry Ross, the great uh, sprint coach, um, who his athletes do only two lifts, basically, uh, bench press and deadlift, um, uh, up to five days a week, usually just three, with the sets being you know that standard. He keeps it around 10 total reps, five sets of two, three sets of three, and big, heavy movements, um, and then high-quality running alongside it. Uh, I think if you're going to try to do both, you can't have garbage and you, you can't have garbage mile days. You know, uh, for those who don't know, and there's kind of a tradition in cross country uh, and track and field. Uh, the runners would have these kind of long, slow distance workouts. Now, the interesting thing is when you're at a university level, what slow is, is not what I see at the park. Slow for these guys are still, I mean, these are fast, slow. Uh, this guy just broke the two hour marathon thing, whether or not, you know, with all the tricks and stuff, you agree with it. But, you know, he averaged four minutes and 30 seconds for every mile for 26. Well, he would win most high school state meets well, <laughs> on a typical mile. I mean, he just, that's just smoking. You won't have any time for the gar garbage. You can't do any garbage weightlifting. You can't do any garbage running. So, if you're going to do both, you can't be doing skull crushers, curls, wrist curls, leg extension, leg curl. It's going to have to be big movements and get the hell out of the weight room. Out there, you're going to have to go fast, go hard, come home. Okay. Not long ago, thanks to my friend Brian, I posted up on uh, the Dan John Q&A over at DaveDraper.com uh, a book called Run Fast and Injury Free. And it got uh, the, the, the people on the forum, we had a nice discussion about the book. Uh, it's an older book, but I still think there's a lot of truth to it. Very basic stuff. You say here, I'm thinking of intervention, strength training for lean body mass and joint mobility. Uh, uh, yes, so absolutely. If you get stronger as a runner, you'll run faster. Okay. Saw that at university. Saw, still see that in my career. Since everybody should be doing loaded carries and rucking, should runners be doing loaded carries and rucking? Well, I think the farmer walk especially – uh, will teach that 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 kind of posture that I think will help you uh, over um, over the long run. <laughs> the wrong huh? little joke there. Uh, at Utah State, all of our uh, all of our runners did sled pulls, and I still think there's value there. If you don't have hills, sled pulls I think are just a given. Whether you need things like bear hug carries, I mean, I don't. I mean, you toss them in far away from a contest and just see what happens. It might be good. Uh, where do you weigh in on the debates about chronic cardio and its dangers? Uh, I would re just refer you to Phil Maffetone's work on that. He has things called, uh, he talks about too much anaerobic work, and then he talks about too much aerobic work. And part of the job as the big kid as a coach is to make sure that you're playing with both of those. Um, so yeah, I, I think you can have too much junk, uh, mileage, um, I don't know if it has the impact on the heart that some people argue. Um, you know, they'll talk about someone dying. Um, a very famous rower died one time rowing. A very famous runner died running. And people went, ah, cardio kills. Well, there's always some. There's always more to the story on that. So uh, I'll leave it to Maffy Tone. I trust him better, okay? I hope that answered everything. Carlos asks a really good question. My question. How are you, I'm taking that's me, able to do all the things you do in a day and still have a life? You work out, you travel, you coach, you eat, you socialize, you do podcasts, you write articles, and you write books, and you read and reread books as well. How and where did you learn to manage your time so effectively, and could you teach some of us that need to do it as well? Well, um, boy, there's, there's, that's, there's a lot to that question. So let's go through the first thing. Uh, for my general fitness, longevity, and health, I have a very simple pirate map. 
I prioritize sleep. Sleep is very important to me. I, t I, I make coffee before I go to bed. I make my to-do list before I go to bed. Um, I wake up and I'm grateful. I do a one moment meditation. I work out and then I, I strive to get eight different vegetables in me every day, uh, which I'm probably out already after my first meal. Those are my, those are my daily habits for health and wellness. Okay. Of course I floss my teeth twice a day and that, well, there's and now we're already to the next, the, the first thing I keep my floss sticks in the well of my car. So when I drive around, I floss my teeth. Um, when you ask questions about how I get so much done, I would have to refer you to the other part uh, that I talk about in the books, uh, Now What and 40 Years with the Whistle. So the pirate map is the things I do every day. To I write every day, I lift almost every day, I eat vegetables every day, I drink a lot of water every day. The other is the pirate map, and a, uh, pardon me, is a shark habit. One bite and it's gone. You'll notice that I always wear this shirt. It's because I have 16 of them. Why 16? That's all they had in North America in my size. I bought every single one. I never think about what I'm going to wear. Uh, I can call, you can call any member of the family and say, it's this time of day, what's, you know, what's your dad, what's your uncle wearing? And they'll probably nail it exactly. But I'm also that way with everything. If you're writing a book and you say, Dan, will you write the forward to my book? I'll email you back. Yes. You send it to me. The moment I get it, I read the entire book and I write the forward and I send it back to you. I have done, I have turned around forwards in about four and five hours. And I, I, you've asked me to do the work and I do it and then it's out of my head. And that's the key. The reason I like menus, a weekly menu for a family, Monday week, Tuesday week, that Thursday, Friday, you got it, is because on Monday, I'm not thinking about what I'm gonna make for dinner. I'm pulling out the things that need to be defrosted for that particular dinner. Or more often, I'm sticking them in a crock pot and I'm already, dinner is being made, dinner is made at eight in the morning. So when you do things like that, uh, you know, it, it comes from Revelation 315, uh, yeah, uh, Revelation 315. You know, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't be lukewarm. I think what hurts most people is that they're lukewarm. And when you ask me something, it's yes or no. And if it's a yes, quit asking me. I said yes. We're going to now move on to flights, hotel rooms, topic. Uh, if it's no, don't keep asking me. I find that very frustrating. Um, if, if I'm going to write something, I write it, and then I'm done with it. Uh, when it comes time in the afternoons, especially when it's time to read, I read. I read for 15 minutes or half an hour, depending really on, <laughs> well, sometimes how good the book is and sometimes how many other things, I, how many other balls I have in the air. Um, I'm leaving for Europe tomorrow. And uh, when I pack for Europe, I noticed there's no difference between the way I pack for Europe and the way I pack for San Francisco. Um, I'm going to be gone for a month and I'm going to carry one bag. And the reason is, is because inside that bag is bags of bags. Okay, and I've got one for uh, sea and snow. It's uh, gloves, hats, things like that with uh, swim trunks and uh, these very thin uh, sandals I found. Um, if you want that, by the way, it's a Dan John workouts. It's in the essays, uh, how I pack. But to me, how I do one thing is how I do everything. So I can't, I can't be, oh, whatever, packing for a trip to uh, Ireland and then all of a sudden be real focused on writing. I have to, I have to get things done. And that's what a shark habit is. A shark habit is deciding what to pack and you pack it. A shark habit is I'm going to wear this shirt and that's what I'm going to wear. A shark habit is saying yes or no. when it's time to say yes or no. Um, you don't have to be insane. I don't think I am. I, like you notice, I socialize very well. Um, this is my second podcast today. Uh, in between the two podcasts, I had a workout and then we had eight people, we had, we had eight friends over uh, breakfast. Um, you just, if you can get things done and, and I mean finished, I mean out of your brain pan, you're much happier. Um, 
there's a book wor worth reading uh, called Parkinson's Law. It's a much older book now. It's from the 50s by C. Northcote Parkinson. I find the book hilarious. And I, I lost my great copy of it. I, well, I didn't. I loaned it out, I'm sure. But there's a wonderful chapter in there about asking a retired old woman to write a note versus a very busy executive. And it's funny because it's absolutely what I see all the time. Uh, the, 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 the old woman uh, can't decide which stationery to use. She looks at 20 different envelopes, finally picks the one with the lace, then second guesses herself and gets six, can't decide how to start the letter. And it's about a five hour process versus the way I would do that. I'd go, and I just did this the other day with a letter to Dick and Joy Notmeyer. Picture, picture, picture. Brrrp, thank you very much. Sign it. Envelope, stamp, gone. Uh, that letter probably took me a minute and a half to write, print, sign. Um, you should have stamps right there in your, your uh, office like you do, like I do. I have stamps. I have envelopes. And I just go, and I'm done. So I can knock off a bunch of letters. Uh, some of the readers wouldn't know what a letter is. Uh, but uh, I can knock off a letter in about a minute and a half because everything's right there and I just do it. And that's the big part. I have my students, uh, I teach online, and they will put things off until the amount of work that's in front of them is an, is glacial. There's just they, 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 they just have so much work they can't push this glacier off a continent. You know, it's much easier to shovel snow when it's this high than when it's this high. So that's how I see the whole my whole life. Um, I, as a teacher, I was always the first teacher to turn in grades. Always. I prided myself on it. And the dean one time said, what do you, don't take, you know, you don't, what do you, just rush through it? And I got, first off, the guy was a jerk because I didn't really care. But the point is, everybody in the facility knew that finals were coming up in June. So I would take care of my grades as much as I could in early May, so I could sit down with a student and say, okay, you're missing all this. You have about a month to take care of it. I wouldn't come up to him in the last week of school. I gave him a month. I had my quarter grades done before I gave out the final because it was so much easier for me to tell a student, you know, little Billy, I would tell students, you got an A first quarter, you got an A second quarter. All you need is a C and above on the final, and I'll give you an A for the semester. So you don't really need to study for this test. And they would look at me like, wow, thank you. Of course, the kid was still going to A on the final because I took all the pressure off of him. But if a kid went, you know, um, C first quarter, A second quarter, I'd say, okay, you know, if you want an A for the semester, you, it's going to be hard. But, you know, and so I was able to have those intelligent conversations with kids and uh, get things done because I got them done a little early. In my life, I've always noticed that early is always better than late. Days early, weeks early is better than 10 seconds late. When I was at Utah State, I would always turn my uh, term papers in, oh, about a month before they were due. And I would tell the professor, listen, I, I mean, I got the nationals. I got the conference championships the week you've required. Is it okay if I turn in early? And if there's a problem, when you give me feedback? Well, every professor in the world loved it because they had one paper versus 50. And they'd say, they'd always get back to me, well, there was an issue on chapter, you know, an issue here and there, but you did great. Here's your A. Yes. And I, I wouldn't say I was class kiss. Okay, that's true. I was class kiss. Okay, I, I was class kiss. But the idea is by turning in early, it also, I also was able to do this with my brain. And I could fo focus on the, the NC2A nationals versus, you know, the Russian Revolution or, or the Decemberist uprising of 1905 or the, the doomsday book, you know, so that's how I do it. Um, and you know what? I would love it if you'd follow up and ask more questions on that. And that was Carlos, right? Uh, Carlos, I like that question a lot. All right. Okay. Next question comes from my good friend, Alexander. As I mentioned on the forum, I want to get into training older clients. The reason why is that I was in an accident a couple years ago and injured my back in several places. Boy, it's fascinating how injuries illuminate, don't they? Uh, you know, in the book, I always say uh, deprivation increases capacity. But uh, it is interesting how injuries and sadness just clarify things. 
I recovered and learned a lot in the process. I want to pass on. Elderly, older people, I don't know which one I like, uh, Alexander, I'll have to give you feedback later, seem to struggle with back problems, and I can relate. Now, I have encountered a weird problem related to this. I lack confidence to get started promoting and charging people for my services. Any suggestions? Well, that's a tough one, because, you know, I'm not very good at it either. <laughs> I don't, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't charge nearly enough, never have. So I'm probably the worst person to ask. But, you know, defrauding the laborer is one of the four sins it, traditionally that goes straight to heaven. So, you know, you've earned the right to make to make uh, an equitable income from this. And so you need to get yourself out of that mindset that I'm not good enough and slide over into the, the idea that my time my time, talent, and treasures are worth some kind of uh, uh, reflection back <laughs> in terms of treasure. So you're just going to have to overcome this. Um, there are better people to talk to than this. I would recommend Thomas Plummer, who's been really helpful for me personally. But uh, you got to just know uh, your time and your, your talents uh, deserve treasure. And you just have to accept that. Um, if I can think of anything, I'll, I'll do my best to follow up on that. But for right now, you just have to, <laughs> I, I know it's so bad. Hey, I put on weight. What should I do? Overcome it. Hey, I, <laughs> it hurts when I walk like this. Overcome it. Hey, I need help with this. Overcome it. I know it's not a great answer, but you just, you're going to have to think this through a little bit. And if you're in any kind of relationship, the person who's with you thinks you should get paid too. Okay. Okay. We got a question from Ian. Ian, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you teach tension to a beginner? <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is that this person has lived in tension their entire life and never, not one time, ever thought about it. Uh, I, I find it interesting that someone who can com be completely stressed about the IRS, tax time, their kids, their the guy who just cut them off on the freeway, but not appreciate to squeeze. Um, so one of the first things that I think about, um, uh, you have more questions here, but um, is the thing about teaching tension, if you use the plank family, the push-up position plank, the glute bridge, the bottom of the goblet squat, uh, a hanging uh, from a pull-up bar, um, actually a suitcase carry can teach tension very nicely. The first thing you think that I would share with you is that you have time, T-I-M-E. Whereas, you know, if you're teaching somebody like the snatch or the discus throw, 1.6 seconds, you know, you don't have a ton of time in 1.6 seconds to, you know, uh, go into an essay. You know, what you have is 1.6 seconds. So when you teach tension, you generally have more time, especially with the beginner. Um, we know that an advanced person can do isometrics for six seconds, but it takes a new person about 12 because it takes them six seconds to get to tension to where it finally works. Uh, bike James, a, a friend of mine who specializes in training for mountain bikes, he has an interesting 90-second isometric protocol called ramping isometrics, where you 30 seconds you go, oh, fairly get yourself into position and start to ease it up. Then you jump up to a higher for 30 seconds. And finally for 30 seconds, you go for it. That's a minute and a half. That's a long time to teach tension. So the, the first tool you have in teaching tension is time. So just remember that. So when I'm doing, if you're doing a push up position plank with me, I've got time to tell you to grip and rip the floor. See, I'm doing that. I'm turning the fingers white. You got time to teach the person to, you, there's, you, we stuck a cluster, a clump of grapes in your armpit, and now I want you to make wine. You squeeze them so hard. I want you to squeeze your heels together. We have something we call Utah birth control. That's where you squeeze your knees together. I want you to squeeze your knees together. Well, in a two-minute plank, I got tons of time to teach that. Okay. The, the biggest drills that I have, the, the follow-up, uh, uh, gentle listener, um, do you have two or three drills or exercises as a go-to? Yeah. Um, 
the number one would be the push-up position plank, number two, probably the glute bridge, and number three, oddly, is the bar hang. Um, with those three, I can easily teach tension. The, it's funny because the bar hang, it, because the load is you, you, you get tension. In the glute bridge, I'll probably put Brett Contreras' glute loops around your, your knees and have you push apart. I'll make, I'll pull, um, I'm going to take your hands and provide resistance as you pull down. So the glute bridge makes your, your glutes work harder. On the push-up position plank, I'll probably push you a little bit to the side, try to pick one of your hands up and go from there. So those would be the exercises I start with. Um, if you if you can do it, if you have someone who's a little bit advanced, uh, more advanced, um, go a real high rack deadlift. I'm talking about maybe two or three inches of movement where the person just holds on to the deadlift at the top. Um, I mean, I've done 800 on that. There's no way I could deadlift eight, but I could sure grip and rip. I could hold on. Well, what that teaches is, is that tension. Uh, the cool thing about teaching tension is it almost automatically teaches relaxation. Because if you're holding 800 pounds for 15 seconds in the rack and you let it go, boom, whew, you just sink down on that tension monitor all, all the way down. And final question here from Ian. And would it be appropriate to start someone who may not move well, but uh, well enough? Yeah, I absolutely think. In fact, this is a teaching technique I use a lot. When someone isn't getting a position, I put them in an isometric hold in the position I want them to be in, hold it for six, ten seconds, shake out, and then do the movement again. It's interesting because in the discus, we have them like hold a post and get them in the position where they're, uh, it's called the bow and arrow position. In my language, we call it 3B. It's And you put their hand 180 degrees opposite where they're going to throw it. And the left foot and right hand, the left foot will be out front. And I might push that left foot in. I might push that left foot out. I might push that left knee. I might push that left knee. Uh, I, might sh I might push the ab wall. I might tighten up that left arm and then they shake it out and all of a sudden the body has learned the position. Um, in 1.6 seconds, you don't have time to learn the positions. But if I can get you to learn it isometrically, it seems to hold. My point is this. There's going to be a movement in something ballistic like in the kettlebell swing uh, at the top position here. That I call the vertical plank where you're I'm going to have you hold it down with bands or just uh, hold it with my arm. Maybe you, you, cause the movement's so ballistic, so dynamic, you don't, you can't do it in real time, but by ingraining it into you with isometrics, that moment of illumination comes in and goes, Oh, I know what you mean. Okay. So for me, tension is the foundation of strength. It's probably the safest, one of the safest things you can learn for not getting hurt. But it also teaches technique better than anything else I know. So, yeah, uh, tension early and often. And then with the leads, you should come back to it about a week or two every year. So in the off season. Thank you, Ian. Good question. Well, thank you again for listening. Each week, it's my honor to come in here and answer these questions and share insights that have come up in other places, other forums, other discussions. I'll try to be here every week. Thank you to my friend Brian for making it so easy for me to do this. And until next week, keep on lifting and learning.